That's crazy. See, I, right? I, I, I didn't want to say on camera, but it smells like marijuana a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. <laughs> I, f I, f I forgot the smell of marijuana, so, um, by the way. Hi, I'm Derek Morrison from The Good Wine Shop, and welcome to a new episode of Bring Your Own. Italy is one of the world's most important and historic wine regions, famous for its iconic red wines. While everyone is familiar with the profound wines of Barolo and Tuscany, it seems not nearly enough attention or credit is given to the country's best white wines. So for our first Italian episode, we decided to focus on the great white wines of Italy. We've arranged a group of wine lovers to bring special bottles from their own cellars. Joining us today are wine buyer and manager of the 10 cases, Gus Pollard, Italian wine merchant Francesca Cioce, and the head sommelier of Luca restaurant, Stefano D'Andrea. Special thanks to the great team at Comptoir Café in Mayfair who hosted us for the filming of the episode. Easily one of my favorite places to go in London to drink wine. You can find them on Instagram with the handle at Comptoir Mayfair. If you enjoy the episode, please take a minute to give a review online. You can follow us on social media at BYO Podcast, and please share this episode with your friends. And subscribe to the podcast to make sure you catch all future episodes. Hi guys, thanks so much for coming tonight. Uh, I'm talking about some great white wines of Italy. Um, let's uh, go around the table and just tell every, uh, some quick introductions so you can tell us about uh, who you are, where you're from, what you do, and uh, we'll start with you, Gus. Uh, uh, so my name is Gus Pollard. Um, I'm from Australia. Uh, I'm currently general manager and wine buyer of the Ten Cases in Covent Garden. Uh, my wine journey started when I was born. Uh, I was very fortunate to be born into a wine family, but I only got serious when I sort of hit my twenties. Uh, ever since then, I've been addicted to the glass. Now, uh, Francesca. Hey, my name is Francesca, and um, I work in the in the London wine trade for the past seven years. So my first job was uh, in retail for Harrods, and then I moved to Hedonism Wines, where I still work on weekends. And in the meantime, I've also started a beautiful career in the sales to the own trade. So, and currently I work for Astro Wine Cellar, one of the probably most prestigious uh, Italian wine specialists in the London uh, wine scene. So. And Stefano. Yeah, I'm Stefano. Thanks for inviting guys. Good to be here with you. Um, I'm, I'm from Italy, of course. And um, I'm working at Luca, Luca restaurant in uh, Farindon. It's the new restaurant from the guys, same guys at the Club Club in uh, Shoreditch. We opened uh, about 20 years ago, and um, I'm the head sommelier, working with a full Italian list, apart from a small selection of uh, champagne growers. <coughs> um, yeah, it's quite exciting to go back to the Italian roots after so many years with the uh, international list here in, um, in London. Um, yeah, it's good to be here and uh, discuss about Italy and uh, the beauty of uh, Italian uh, whites. I moved here from Italy, um, as you can tell by my Canadian accent, um, but uh, I've I've always been amazed by what I feel is how underrated white wines from Italy are in the UK. And so that was kind of, we, we, we wanted to do an Italian episode. And this is kind of our, um, uh, our, this is our first Italian focus episode. We were trying to go, you know, something classic, something, uh, what should we do is the theme. And um, we just couldn't get away from the idea that there's just so many great white wines from Italy that don't get maybe uh, as much attention um, relative to some of their international counterparts. So we said, Let's go with that, and um, I'm really excited by some of the wines we're going to crack open today, and uh, um, some some proper icons and some some uh, some old vines and, and and some lots of good stories. So I'm excited to hear what each of you say about them. But why don't we start with uh, Francesca? You've got a yes, beautiful bottle uh, for us. It's a beautiful bottle coming from an uh, an amazing producer, Enzo Pontoni. We are in Friuli in one of the greatest uh, uh, subzones of the Friuli region, which is the Colli Orientali. Um, Enzo Pontoni is arguably considered one uh, of the greatest uh, wine producer of uh, fine uh, Italian white wines. Uh, his, um, uh, his, his story starts obviously in this uh, beautiful village of Butrio, in the art of the Colli Orientali. The winery, the family has always uh, cultivated vines, but since actually 1981 uh, they started to bottle wines. Along with Friolano, it does uh, um, a selection of beautiful white wines. Uh, he also produced uh, the Malvasia, he produced the Ribola Gialla, which are two other beautiful indigenous grape variety of Friuli, and he also gave lots of emphasis to Chardonnay and Sauvignon as well. His approach to vineyards is uh, organic, biodynamic, High density, in the youngest vineyards, he can plant up to 9,000 plants uh, per hectare. In the oldest, obviously the oldest, they're quite old, so normally average, uh, we are looking in 2, 3,000, uh, 4,000 plants per hectare. And his vinification is uh, completely in oak, 
he use either barrique or French tonneau. And he will uh, do his vinification, his malolactic, which is something that for a short period he also stopped doing it because he wanted to concentrate more on the purity of the fruit. But he actually realized that in order to create uh, an age worthy uh, wine, he needed to add uh, also uh, a little bit of malolactic in his uh, vinification. And then uh, after the, the alcoholic fermentation, obviously the wines, in, in this case the whites and especially the Friulano, will spend uh, up to 12 months in contact on the so with very little batonnage. So this is a 2015, unfortunately I ran out uh, of all my old uh, bottles of Miani, so this one is really the oldest bottle that I had, uh, because it's really interesting to approach Miani, uh, I would say probably after five, six, seven, eight years. Well, it's really, um, easy, to, it's really easy to see how um, the wine has plenty of spine to age, and the, in, the Frulano is I think one of his more um, like more more effusive kind of absolutely. whites as far as they go, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I would say that, uh, yes, uh, really Friulano is, I, I, I mean, to say that is a signature white wines is probably too much because I don't want to take anything away from the other white wines, which are absolutely amazing. But, you know, Friulano is the identity of Colli Oriental, is the identity of Friuli, is a beautiful indigenous grape variety. It's really interesting, because I mean, maybe you can tell me a bit more of this, but, you know, as I understand, Enzo used to be really obsessed with um, uh, his focus used to be on the Chardonnay and on the Sauvignon, and he really believed in the nobility of these, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, typical grapes in a sense for the, for the area, but more associated with the great wines of France. Yeah. Um, and in his own evolution, he's started to discover and, in, and, and um, become much more passionate about the indigenous grapes of the region, maybe even eclipsing his obsession with Chardonnay and Sauvignon. And, it's, I think it's quite interesting when you talk about iconic cult winemakers yeah. to see this kind of evolution because, you know, that's quite rare. I mean, it's not like, you know, um, I don't know, Valentini's done the opposite and started becoming obsessed with Chardonnay or something, for example. But to see them be iconic and, and quite fastidious for so long and then kind of start to have their own evolution is, I think, quite one of the most fascinates me about his yeah. wines. I think. He's a, he's a fantastic man. He's, I mean, when you go and see him, he's really a garagist uh, winemaker. Uh, his entire production is in this retail garage uh, where you have uh, all this amount of barrique and French tonneau, and he will really uh, take you through every single uh, barrel, barrique, and taste everything. Uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely a fantastic man. Uh, He's quite reclusive as well. He doesn't, oh, yeah. He doesn't really leave the vineyard. He hasn't <laughs> left. Kind of his thing. He hasn't left his region for the past 15 years. And that's, uh, that's fascinating. I mean, so he has a partner that essentially he as uh, a friend that he basically says, "This is all my wine. You sell it. I don't yeah, want to deal with any correct, of that." So. But then, you know, I had a really good story from a friend of mine who uh, was working with the wines, and they went to the winery and they were tasting barrels with them, and they tasted the Malvasia from one vintage and. And they're like, this wine is amazing. Like they were just, their mind was blown. And, he, and Enzo said, he said, you know, I'm not really so happy with it. I don't think I'm going to release it. And he just, and they said, no, yeah. no, don't, don't. Like he's like, I think we I'm going to pour it. I'm going to pour it into this, yeah. like down the drain or something like this. And they're like, no, 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 we'll take everything. Please just let us have. It. And he didn't, he didn't release the wine. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, we are, whenever we think of like the great winemakers or the greatest domains uh, in the world, the, there's so often these very enigmatic characters. And um, But to be so obsessive about what you want to release under your label when you have people begging for any ounces and a wine that's produced in such minuscule proportions, it's... Uh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So what do you think about the wine? I think, it's a, obviously, it's 2015. 2015 was a warm vintage in Italy. Let's uh, not forget it. Uh, so obviously, um, it's a vintage that has developed uh, <coughs> quite in full the ripeness of the fruit. But having said that, uh, that's that's kind of the style for his Frulano. Is the wine a bit rounder and fuller. correct, but, but the wine has uh, kept uh, <coughs> is a vertical. Uh, uh, profile. I mean, everything is really there. It's firm, it's solid on the palate. You don't have this uh, overweight given by the ripeness of the fruit. And this uh, really aftertaste of um, almond, which is typical of the of the Friulano. I mean, obviously, it's very distinctive, and you can really get it on the nose, but definitely at the end of the palate, it's absolutely. Yes.
Beautiful. You got this warm feeling, very warm on the on the yeah. first palate, but then you go this freshness that take you back on uh, on track. It's quite long. The, uh, the wine, uh, yeah, super. is there. Yeah. Beautiful texture, great elegance, great finesse, great purity, great density, creaminess in the mid palate, uh, um, and it's just a baby. I, I just think that really, when we look at Miani, we are really, for me, in front of one of the greatest producers, not only of Italy. In, yeah. in the world. It's definitely a wine of contrast and texture, I think, is the kind of the, um, what stands out to me. It's, it's both got this kind of mouth-filling richness of texture. It's, you feel, but you feel that spine of the terroir really giving it a, a, a really firm backbone Absolutely. to give it some length and, and, and precision. And then the aromatic profile, it's, it's both like, um, you get, I mean, it almost it has this kind of, when you think of the textures on the palate, it has a lot of this kind of like of a very, of a top Merceau producer or a kind of, um, really, you know, a nice, uh, um, um, you know, Burgund Burgundian structure in terms of the, the, the texture and firmness and the, and the spine and the minerality. But then obviously this aromatic profile and these flavors are a complete departure. And so there's still lots to go. I mean, the wine uh, is still tight. Uh, if we would approach this wine in five years time, uh, it, will, it, could be, it will be completely on a different aromatic uh, uh, level. Uh, but... Um, I think even throughout the evening, it'll be interesting to come back to this wine later because you feel that yeah. almond and you feel a bit of that kind of almost tropical fruit and a bit of this kind of tropical fruit, which, as like I said, almost like coconut, come, uh, come typical, or typical like. from the vintage. Because actually, you know, the more um, tropical fruit profile uh, in terms of yeah, peach flavors, pineapple flavors, that's something that comes predominantly more from the Friulano Buri. Um, Philip tends to be much more austere. Philip tends to deliver different uh, aromatics, uh, more on uh, pear, more on uh, apple. Uh, but obviously, this is a warm vintage, so the sun obviously is reflected in the profile, in the aromatic profile of the of the wine. But having said that, uh, I think that the power, the strength. Uh, and the profile of the punka soil still managed to come through and to maintain the wine, yeah. as I said, extremely vertical with a beautiful acidic backbone and great minerality. It's quite reductive as well, which kind of, I'm, I'm excited to see how this opens up a bit. I mean, I mean that in a really good way, in terms of there's just, as you say, there's this richness, but the spine. And the, Absolutely. Uh, it's definitely, you can tell, there. you can see the, the ageability of it. So Gus, why don't you tell us a bit about the wine you brought and uh, um, why you brought it and uh, pour us a little taste of you. All right, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I bought a bottle of um, uh, Cantina Tolana, uh, Pinot Bianco, so the Vorberg Cuvée um, from 2004. Uh, so a couple of reasons why I bought this wine. So I'm going to start with the, uh, the sentimental uh, reason. So uh, my journey into Italian wine started um, just before I came to the UK, really. Uh, so I've been into wine... Uh, the majority of my adult life, um, but uh, only really uh, had the Italian immersion um, from just before I, I left to come to, to the UK. Uh, I was working for a restaurant group in Australia called the Rockpool Group, and uh, just before I was due to uh, leave, six months before, uh, we opened a Italian restaurant, a solely Italian wine list, um, uh, of which uh, the wine director, David Lawler, my mentor at the time, uh, trusted me uh, to look after, so so which is a daunting task for someone who's uh, who's, who's from Australia and very used to drinking French wines and uh, and and I, I'd explored Piemonte and I explored uh, Tuscany, but 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 outside of that, I was I was I was pretty green. So anyway, I uh, immersed myself in the list, and and uh, it was one of the best things I could have ever done. Now I've got a, a newfound experience and um, an emotional attachment to uh, to Italian wines. This uh, uh, particular cuvee from Tolano was one of the first ones that uh, I, I, I uh, connected with. Um, so I've always had a fascination ever since. So continued Tolano um, uh, being a co-op uh, from Alto Adige, um, but uh, regarded as a great co-op, perhaps the best co-op, um, uh, growing uh, proper tewa wines um, from, a, 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 from a beautiful tewa. Um, using using grapes that are perfectly suited to this part of Italy, I believe. 
Um, I was really fascinated by uh, the ageability of these wines. I've, I've not had 2004 as a vintage before, but I'm really looking forward to sharing it. Um, so the Vorberg Cuvée, um, Vorberg being from the, the face of the mountain. Um, uh, Francesca, correct me if I'm wrong at any point, please. <laughs> um, uh, I know that you've got a, uh, an in-depth knowledge of this producer and uh, professional attachment. But um, uh, so the, 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 t the specific uh, terroir uh, for, for the Pinot Bianco that goes into this Cuvée ranges between 400 and 900 uh, yeah. metres above, uh, above sea level. Which is uh, which is a broad, um, yeah. <laughs> a broad array, uh, which fascinates me. Um, they uh, are working uh, so close to the land, um, green harvesting, um, excessive vineyard work um, across what is small for a co-op, but still a big operation. Um, I think they work with about... Um, hectares, um, I think it should be probably just 200. below 200 it's hectares. A, I think it's 200 uh, and then with yeah. Adriano, it's uh, perhaps gone over to 240. This is the winery, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I have a, 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 a deep emotional uh, connection and also a, a real curiosity um, to this wine. So I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to share some around. Yeah, yeah. I think... Um, Thanks so much. I was fascinated by the uh, by reading about the ageability of these wines. So back in the in the fifties, uh, when Italy was recovering from the World Wars, um, from, Philo, from the Second World War, of course. Uh, being yeah. a co-op, um, uh, aging wines was not really an option. Uh, wine was drunk as a as a as a um, commodity, uh, more so, and and for this nutritional benefits which we all know about. But um, but the but the ability to, to especially white wines tuck them away and, and age them was 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 frowned upon and, and not economically viable at that stage. But the cellar master of the time uh, saw the aging potential and, uh, and, and would, would tuck bottles away uh, behind brick walls, and, uh, yeah. which, is, which started this, uh, this culture and which I think is, is still strong to the day of, of holding back stock. Um, and, and what a great move that was at that time because now they're regarded as some of, the, some of Italy's most... Um, uh, the, the aging potential of these wines is, 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 is up there with the greatest whites of Italy. Uh, and, uh, and, and now, yeah, they hold back. And, and, and I think even wines back to the 50s, from what I've read, uh, can still show beautifully today. They are just amazing. Um, they're just amazing. Um, Sebastian Stoker, who is the man, um, who was the man, unfortunately, he passed away just um, after Christmas. Uh, I mean, he passed away, obviously, he was, uh, I think, over 90s. So, but yeah, he's the man who got in charge in the Cantina Terlano from the 50s. And uh, as Gus said, yes, he used to hide uh, um, dozens and dozens of bottles because he really believed in the potential of what uh, Alto Adige wines, especially white wines, can do. And, um, and, the, and if today Cantina Terlano has a, a beautiful library of very old uh, uh, bottlings, uh, not only of Pinot Bianco, but even uh, Sauvignon, uh, Silvaner, it's really thanks to uh, Sebastian Stoker that used to put everything uh, away. Well, I, think that's a good I tasted uh, some of the Pinot Bianco from the 50s. Uh, I was very, very lucky and they are absolutely unbelievable. Uh, they are wines of still a very uh, long aging potential. There are wines uh, that they haven't come to their hand. They still have so much to give. Uh, we are in a mountain viticulture. We are uh, in the beautiful village of Terlano. Cantina Terlano takes name from the village of Terlano. And what really gives uh, this beautiful purity, finesse and um, age-worthy profile to the soil, to, to the wines is the soil. In Terlano, there is this uh, uh, type of soil called uh, uh, porfido quarsifero, porfil um, quarsifero. Oh, tip of my tongue. <laughs> porfido quarsifero, <laughs> which is very unique. Porfil, they also do the lagrain porfil, they do the sauvignon quarsi, you know. Porfido quarsifero, what is porfido quarsifero? Porfido quarsifero is a, it, this volcanic rock, uh, very rich uh, in iron, uh, rich in quartz element, uh, um, reddish color, you know, this porphyr rock uh, have a different uh, uh, tones in terms of colors, and the one of Terlano is reddish. And this is very specific to this region, it's right? Very it's very specific, uh, it's but it's very specific of Terlano, and this is extremely unique. 
Vulcano, um, sorry, Trellano Vineyards <coughs> lies inside a volcano. Mm. Okay, so the whole uh, area is uh, completely volcanic rock. And the way, according to really the greatest specialists in the world, Pino Bianco, because when we talk about Cantina Terlano, we talk about uh, different elements for me. And uh, uh, another mm -hmm. important element is the profile of Pino Bianco, which is a very under estimated and underrated worldwide mm -hmm. but when it comes to his adaption in the soil of Terlano according to uh, the greatest wine professional in the world uh, it really performs in a very unique uh, way giving but, but, great but, but, but not just the soil also the the the, the climatic ah. conditions as well right so you so firstly altitude and and then and then secondly you've got um the the winds coming north from from legarda and south from, from Legarda, the Alps. absolutely. so you've got, you've got you've got a lot of airflow which uh, pino bianco obviously is uh, extremely susceptible steepy to the right sites uh, absolutely so i was there in november i <laughs> i went to well because forbeck is is a is the selection of, uh, of the Pinot Bianco from the oldest uh, vineyard. And actually, <laughs> you climb the vineyards because they're so steep that really, oh my God, you feel that you're falling. In my uh, mind, this is where Pinot Bianco shines. Like yeah, it, absolutely. It's a, I, I can't, it doesn't immediately spring to my mind a, a better expression. No. Um, and, and that's not Pinot Bianco only, that's Pinot Blanc or Weissburgunder. It doesn't, it doesn't, this, this is a holy. This, this is it. Yeah. Holy. Yeah. 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 It's amazing on the nose. I, um, it, you know, it, it, that that kind of that um, bottle age smell is kind of blowing off of it, and it's it's amazing on the palate. It's still so much tension and freshness, and but uh, obviously some of that bottle aged uh, texture, that kind of slow oxidative uh, aging texture. But it's got this amazing kind of bright hay cashew nut kind of, um, you know, th that kind of tertiary profile, but then it's still really Yeah, but I still uh, maintain alive. a great freshness. Mm. Uh, but especially, I mean, if you go back, uh, I was very lucky to go back to some of the oldest uh, uh, bottling. Uh, uh, let's do not forget, uh, for what is for me my consideration, that uh, global warming has influenced very much. Okay, this area in the 50s, in the 60s, used to deliver wines, uh, Pinot Bianco, of such a great austere profile that really needed uh, at least 20 times uh, before opening up. And now things, uh, and this is the reason why Cantina Terlano used to be very much appreciated uh, regionally. But uh, I'm saying something that probably is uh, the uh, Klaus Gasser, which is the great man behind uh, Cantina Terlano, once told me that there was a time when uh, they couldn't sell a bottle of Forbeck. They were, they were selling Forbeck in Rome, uh, two bottles sold, two free of charge. Because nobody wants uh, to drink uh, wines of such a great austerity, such a great uh, profile. You know, the, the, the white wines that people used to love to drink were, you know, the ones with high concentration of, may of maybe oak flavors, you know, quite extremely round. Uh, but, um, so they really work hard uh, in order really to make Cantina Terlano become so successful even outside. It wasn't so easy in the beginning. The wines were extremely tight, was very austere, and um, it took decades before the wine could start to show up uh, as an uh, authentic uh, profile. You need to believe in a grape like that, because yeah. as you said, you, people, I mean, there's no market. This wine has no market, so, but they're still doing every harvest and they keep making great wine. This is the best expression of the Terlano. So I mean that that kind of segues pretty nicely into one of the things I wanted to ask you. We you know we talk about um, you know being committed to a grape and um, really having to persevere against maybe what a market's ready for to what the winemaker believes in. Absolutely. And um, you know I think that kind of provokes a question that I want to ask you guys. The idea was I want to say great wines of Italy, great white wines of Italy, and that was the idea for this conversation tonight. And I said deliberately not greatest white wines of Italy because great white wines of Italy because we obviously can't encapsulate everything. But I wanted to provoke the conversation with what defines a great white wine, and we're you know we're tasting some you know we talk about ageability, we talk about terroir, we talk about all these different things um, that we maybe associate with um, Burgundy or other kind of great white wine regions. But um, you know, what does it teach of you guys that that um, defines a great white wine? So uh, in 
speaking about this wine um, specifically, why this falls into that category, if you, if you, why I think it does anyway, in my opinion, um, I feel that a great wine has to be has to be true to itself. So it has to be at home where it is. It has to be um, it has to be comfortable within its place. Okay, so that doesn't mean that it has to age forever. It doesn't mean that it has to have the most complex or or, or diverse soil types. It doesn't have to mean that it's a a grape that uh, is specifically from this place. Um, uh, indigenous to the place. I don't think it has to mean that at all. I think it just has to be, um, it has to be true. So, uh, and that can be quite broad, but the way that I believe that this wine is true is that A, it's perfectly suited to the varietal, the terroir. Uh, it's, a, it's a very specific terroir. The way that the winemaking is, um, is conducted or the, or, the, or the wine raising is conducted is, uh, is, is, is very simple. Uh, I mean, they're using just old, old wood and extended leaves aging. Um, uh, and the fact that it ages, ages for an extended period of time is, is a beautiful thing. If it only aged for 10 to 15 years, would it not be a fine wine? No, I, I, I think it would still be a fine wine. But I think that this is, this is a varietal which is perfectly in its place in this vineyard, raised in this way by the Cantina Tolana, which I think is sort of the parameters that I like to place on a fine wine. I think one thing you mentioned that I think is really interesting is that you know it doesn't have to age, but you know you want to, when you're tasting a wine at its apogee or when you're tasting wine at its best, um, whether it's two years in, three years in, ten years in, you know, at that expression of itself, what does it kind of look like? And you know, Vorburg is a wine that really does take, it just happens to take some time to yeah. come into that apogee or to come into that, you know, state of um, um, really revealing itself, its true self, which it's starting to now. I mean, we could easily say that this wine has plenty of life left in it. And one of the things I struggle with in retail with the Release, newly released vintages is that they're so far from that. They're beautiful wines and when you taste them you know that you're tasting a profound wine that just needs time to age and um, you know we, we do some fantastic stuff with uh, a number of their wines and, and they're all inspiring but definitely this wine on release take it home and put it in your cellar for a little while because you know as you start to see you know this with you know almost 15 years of age on it it's really revealing a completely different and more, more profound per, uh, expression of itself it's, it's, it's just a beautiful evolutionary process with this wine in particular isn't it like it just uh, it really it's got good bones at the start but but when you see it with this sort of age, it's a, it's a different beast and it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a journey, yeah. So the wine I brought tonight is the Joaquin Piante Lapio Fiano 2012 from, uh, um, from Irpina, from Campania. Um, let's get some in the glass here, Brenda. Uh, you know, this, uh, this is a special wine to me that um, uh, my wife and I both love and that I had the pleasure of working with for, for a number of years. And um, Raffaele, the, the proprietor of the estate, is a pretty, pretty fascinating guy. Um, he's one of the most passionate European men you'll probably ever meet. And um, um, well, you know, well, I'll, I'll just talk a bit about the, uh, about the winery and the wine before we talk about like, kind of what's in the glass, because it's definitely a, not Fiano like um, is maybe more typical. But uh, um, so Raffaele, and his brother, his family, they had a, they had a, um, a more large-scale winery that um, they kind of have built up quite a, a successful business with. And then, you know, he's a very proud European man, as I said, and he really wanted to commit to kind of preserving and celebrating um, the greatness of Fiano and the great wine, the great varieties of, uh, of European. And he's also done a really important preservation project on, in Capri, which has been um, basically saving the last of the vineyards there, which has been, become such a popular resort um, holiday destination that there's so much development has really displaced and destroyed a lot of the vines there and so um, I, I've always thought it was really interesting and, and um, um, really admirable the way he's kind of committed to his local region and these grapes to kind of preserve and, and celebrate them and um, this particular wine he does a few he does a couple of different fianos the vino della stella is his fiano di avellino um, and this one is not part of the DOCG and, and this is from a single vineyard in Lapio which is actually the oldest existing vineyard of fiano um, so it, for many people it is the kind of the birthplace of Fiano in the area um, and um, the average vine age in this vineyard is 120 years old and even the younger vines have been grafted onto the original rootstock and I, I've, I've been to the vineyard and there's you know it's it's proper trees that you're, you're kind of dwarfed by and the, you see the clusters coming off of these these old trees essentially and it's just 
you know, they're so powerful. And, and um, you know, this wine is kind of made to kind of um, reflect that in a way as well. Um, you know, you're obviously in your opinion, in this area of um, Avellino, we're talking about a lot of volcanic soil that's been, that comes down to kind of the ancient eruptions of Vesuvius. And, um, and what's really interesting is there's so much intensity in that terroir and intensity and obviously these, these massively long and complex root systems. But um, this wine in particular is quite unique in that it's, you know, it's about three weeks or so of skin maceration and then it spends a little bit of about a month or so with a little bit of a voile develops on top of it and then it's topped up. It's fermented in uh, chestnut in chestnut barrels and then age, er, in an open oak top fermenter and then it's aged in chestnut barrels. and, and um, you know, it's, you know, we've talked about two of the old uh, um, two icons who've been around for a long time, and we're going to taste another that's maybe the most iconic after this. And this is fairly new producer to the market in the last uh, several years who's quite revered if you go around Italy, but it's just kind of starting to have uh, um, trickle into the, into the uh, other international markets. But um, it's quite, uh, uh, I think it's quite fascinating that it's, it may be a young producer, but I mean, he's found the most historic vineyards to work with, and um, and it's all part of his quest to really champion and celebrate the wines and, and grapes of this region internationally as his kind of life's work. And so, you know, when you when you put your nose into the glass, this wine's got almost as dry as much dry extract as Masetto to to kind of just get a sense of the texture and size of the wine. Um, but cool. You know, 13 and a half percent. We're not talking about a massive alcoholic wine. I just mean in the terms of that there's so much depth. And, but uh, this is what we want. I mean, uh, finally, back to drinking wines, which are in their 13, 13.5 and I mean, uh, ABV. Um, back to, I think, uh, the, the original uh, discussion about uh, underrating or underestimated uh, Italian wines, Italian terroir. For me, even Irpinia is a... Uh, very much underestimated. Uh, um, when people think about uh, Fiano, when think people think about Greco, or Aglianico, or Taurasi, obviously because Irpinia is this beautiful <coughs> wine region that uh, embraces th those three amazing DOCG, the Fiano, the Greco, and the Taurasi, um, I realize when I speak uh, to people uh, about those wines that very much they are associated to yeah, we are in Campania, so they are associated to the south of Italy. But it is very important, so of course we are in the south of Italy, and definitely the south of Italy, the sun of the south of Italy is completely reflected in this glass. But it is very important uh, uh, to actually uh, deliver the terroir of Irpinia for what is, it is, uh, which is a completely mountain viticulture. Um, so this is, a, we are half an hour uh, driving, or probably even more than half an hour actually from uh, Naples, uh, from the Costa Malfitana. That's where you get, uh, you know, the uh, hot Mediterranean climate uh, conditions for viticulture. But we are just half an hour behind from a ski resource, which is uh, in the mountains, in the Apennine, which is 2,000 meters uh, um, in elevation. So here we are in the mountains, viticulture in the Olipinia. Uh, for Fiano, Greco, or Tarasi, starts from 400 meters all the way up to almost 900 meters. That's the thing. We think of so, Campania, we think of Amalfi Coast, we think exactly. of beaches and seafood. And when you go to the heart of Irpinia, I mean, it's mountains, it's woods, it's wild boar. I mean, it's, it's completely it's austere. If you absolutely. go probably in one of the highest uh, uh, vineyards of the old Irpinia, which is Monte Marano, which is fully dedicated to Aglianico for the Taurasi, you really realize, I mean, you are really in the mountains. The, the, the area, the surroundings, they are completely austere. And same things even in uh, some sites of Greco or Fiano. In fact, uh, here, grapes are not harvested uh, at the end of August, beginning of September. The, growing season, the beauty of those, uh, uh, of those wines is, for me, for what has been my experience with uh, Irpinian wines uh, and with the many trips that I did, because I spent uh, probably five, six, seven trips in Irpinia, is the fact that uh, it's an area with a very long growing season. Uh, because of, it is an area that benefits during the daytime of the heat of the Mediterranean sun. But at night, uh, temperatures will drop by 
10, 12 degrees, and really this helps uh, to all the grapes of the area to retain freshness uh, and to develop in full uh, the physiological ripeness. So it's a very long growing season, a growing season that during the time uh, allow the fruit uh, and the sugar ripeness, obviously, to, to yeah, work. And, you know, Fi Fiano obviously is like, I mean, Fiano, the, the, the name Fiano for the grape is kind of an old semi, uh, several stage derivative from, um, you know, Latin uh, apius, which is the Latin word for bee, Peace. and they started to, Peace, and, yeah. and a piano to, to fiano, in, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a whole lot of etymology evolution within that, but essentially the, they started in, in, in this area, um, the vignerons, you know, way back in the day, um, would notice that the bees were always more attracted to the fiano grapes because it has this natural sweetness, this natural honeyed character. Um, and also, an interesting thing that we need to talk about with fiano is the amount of intrinsic flavor within the grapes. So it always, even in, you know, I, I've obviously highlighted some of the vinifications of this wine, which can maybe give you, if you haven't tasted it, until you taste it, um, for people watching and listening, the wrong conception about how this wine maybe sounds can, like it can be quite heavily manipulated. But when you taste the wine, it's, there's, it's so honest to the variety, but also there's so much intense salinity and tension as a backbone that's obviously coming from the soils in this wine that is what I, was, I think one of the things that always captivates me about it. And you know, I, I really like what you said about a wine being true to itself because for me, this is in lots of ways, it's very unique, but very much the um, epitomizes the Fiano grape and reflects the, both of the grape itself and also the terroir in your Absolutely. pina because you're getting so much of that volcanic mountainous uh, volcanic, terroir uh, the concentration of this old vines i mean it's really austere profile i mean even here we are in front of a warm vintage 2012 it was uh, pretty warm uh, but you don't have you never have this uh, you know um, overweight of the ripeness of the fruit. Uh, still here, the temperature range between day and night, the volcanic soil, the high elevation, they help the wine to preserve uh, its beautiful spine. So... And I feel like that, that, that vinification really helps it to kind of stand up to yeah. what is already there as a natural raw materials of this yeah. wine. And it sort of emphasizes certain components of the wine as well, doesn't it? Um, it's a heady bean, like it's very, very, um, it's, it's a powerful wine. Um, but, 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 but I think that, that sort of oxidative handling that, that, that it's received just emphasizes the salinity and it, 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 it all comes together. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really, it's fascinating stuff. This is my first time tasting and it's, it's a yeah, really powerful wine. You express the personality of the, uh, Mr. Pagano as well. Like I can feel his, um, his touch on the wine because he's, he's, a, he's a You can hear Raffaele yeah, screaming yeah. at you about uh, passionately yeah. about how great is Campania and how honest he's is like, the... I met so him important. once in Merano in Fessio. It was um, a yeah, happy meeting with him. In our portfolio where we describe the wines, I said, you know, the first line I think it says is, Raffaele Pagano is a force of nature. And it like and, and so are his wines and and, uh, and I think that's uh, I really glad you mentioned that because he's you know um, he, him talking about Fiano gets me excited about Fiano. <laughs> yeah. so, so so from a perspective of not knowing the guy, what's like what's he like? Have another taste in the glass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he just, I mean, he's, he's, it's, um, and I love this about Italy, and this is what, you know, moving to Italy, making cheese, and then meeting a bunch of winemakers is what got me into wine. Yeah. And um, it was just that there was so much history, and that he was so passionate about it, and just felt like this really strong need to kind of preserve and advocate um, for what was going on there. And we, you know, obviously Torazzi and the great work by Master Berdino to really kind of put this on the map in, um, oh, yeah, in lots of ways to champion yeah, yeah. the region. Definitely, but, you know, when yeah. we go south of Rome, it's a whole other world of Italy yeah. in terms of, you know, the first two wines we've tasted are from, from the, the north. north. Of, of and course. so when we think about 50 years ago, the, the economic realities of, like, these different parts of Italy are a completely different world, and even today to a degree. Um, and so, um, but when we think historically and we go back to, you know, the days of, you know, when Vesuvius ex uh, erupted and the ancient Romans, I mean, Alianico and, you know, um, the Flair uh, Flarnium wines, and, you know, this was, this was the first growths of Italy in, you know, thousands of years ago. And so, you know, when you see the evolution of Italian wine, and then, of course, just the you know, Italian society, and then, um, you know, modern Italian society, and then, and then, you know, Italian fine wine being relative to um, elsewhere in Europe is such a, you know, we're talking about 50 years, 40 years, really, of, of it still coming on. I mean, it's crazy when we think of Piemonte, even, you know, the, some of the most iconic terroir and crew 
of, of Italian wine that they were you know they were shared crops and that they were you know they're growing cherries and and, uh, uh, and everything else in the in the vineyards uh, you know only a few only a few years ago really yeah. relative to the you know wines that were bottled at the same time were harvested at the same time next to like hazelnuts and stuff like that so um, and I think with Italy and we think of we can look at many other parts of Europe that have an ancient history of wine production and how it's only really relatively recent that it's been re resurrected so um, to find this old ancient, you know, vineyard it's that been, it's been yeah redirected by uh, modern producers, but exactly like happened even in Etna. <coughs> I mean, those areas. I mean, viticulture has always been there. Viticulture is all is been part of the culture for centuries and centuries and centuries, but somehow it's always been kept uh, hidden, you know, from uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, probably the situation of what happened in Etna is even much more. Im uh, important. It really describes very much how, I mean, uh, the Greeks took viticulture in the Mount Etna when, but it, only in the past 20, 25 years, uh, yeah. thanks to probably, I don't know, two, three wineries, and amongst uh, uh, the three wineries, I would uh, definitely put the name of Benanti, you know, yeah. in, in terms of really bringing the, uh, the profile of uh, what uh, Etna can do in terms of white uh, and in terms of red. Uh, uh, and obviously, and make uh, this wine region very popular across the world. So, uh, for me, again, we are in front of another amazing terroir of Italy. Uh, I don't even want to say underestimated. Uh, well, I think it's... not well known. Uh, as I said, people, uh, you know, when they drink Campania, the majority of the people they associate, okay, Campania, the south of Italy. I mean, why should I spend? Because El Pina is expensive, it's a mountain viticulture. Fiano d'Avellino is probably actually one of the better known appellations internationally yeah. for uh, Italy to produce high quality uh, white wines. And, you know, there's a bit of an understanding that, and obviously, some of the bigger producers now in the market paved the way in lots of ways, but. Um, this, for me, this wine is really speaks to the history of the region, both with the oldest existing vineyard and, and um, just the profound, you know, it's a pretty uh, imposing in a, in a profound way. It's both ethereal and powerful. Yeah. It's got all of these contrasts. And for me, we, you know, we talk about a great wine and what it's, the grape and the place says and the intersect of those things. But when you taste the wine, for me, I'm always looking for those contrasts, like something, that push-pull, that it's ethereal, but then it's also very kind of powerful in the mouth. It's, you know, it's mouth-filling, but then at the same time, it's very linear and tense and nervy, and, you know, you're getting all of these things that don't really know where to look, and when you taste the wine, it just pushes and pulls you all these directions, and then you realize, I've been sitting here not saying anything for about a minute, just, thinking about just everything dealing with going this, on what's, going on. Going on. Yeah. what's going on. And I so, think wines that challenge us um, are also kind of things that, and you get that, um, in, in all the wines we tasted, and also the contrast with this being from the south to the wines of the north, I think is Absolutely. really helping to highlight that you know the terroir everywhere uh, in Italy. That and you know we haven't tasted anything from from Etna or elsewhere in Sicily. No, unfortunately. Um, I mean, there's yes. you know we could do you know this we could do ten laps of this. Do another episode forest. on, on, on Sicily alone. Absolutely, yeah. and that's why I wanted to great yeah. white wines, really not so, the greatest. Derek, can I just bring the question back to you? Actually, that you asked me, um, what what defines a great wine for you? Exactly what you've just said, or is there more to it? Well, I think it's. I think you know, in the one sense, we look for these things in terms of the ageability and and um, um, what is that? I, I guess I always think, what does that wine say uniquely that no other wine can? Um, whether it's about that place or that you know um, um, something that it expresses that is that can't be replicated elsewhere. I think I'm I'm always looking for for that in a sense. But sometimes it's just about how does the wine make you feel? And, and um, I remember whenever I think of this wine, the first time I've tasted it, and every time I've tasted it, it always awakens some emotion in me. And sometimes you can quantify it, you can pinpoint it, you can, you can, you can feel the deductive reasoning of, you know, the grapes, the, 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 the structure, how this wine has aged or will age, and all of these things. You can kind of trace the line to being like, I get it, this is a great wine, this is, does something quite exceptional that not most of the wines can do in the world, but other times it's just like... It's just the moment. Oh. Some of those wines, <laughs> are just, you taste the wine and you just go, I don't know, you know, you can't think of the words to describe it and you know I've had several years with this wine and different vintages of this wine trying to come up with a way to quantify every aspect of it but when was still... the first vintage of Joaquim um, do you if you remember it uh, that's okay that's a good question I think when they've started uh... um, I think it was like 2007? 2007 I mean it might not be that so now, he's had an evolution as well yeah. with with wine I'm not sure if that was this vineyard 
Um, but I think it was somewhere around then. I mean, he has a 2009 Tarazi that still is in barrel or not released yet. Does it do a Greco as well? He does a Greco. Okay, it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's like, it's so briny. I think it's one of the most, um, the most beautiful. Is it, is it as weighty as this? No, it's no. much more... Uh, so this obviously Fiano and Greco are very different grapes. So it's a kind of when you talk about skin contact, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 the reason they do the skin contact with the Fiano isn't because they set out to make a skin contact wine necessarily, but that Fiano itself lends very well. Because they want that, to, that, so, that. Oh yeah, it's, it's so the red the, of it's the white grape the variety. Like the the grape. So they want to extract, yeah. and you've got these old vines, really intense, concentrated uh, grapes and, and skins, and, and so. Um, a bit of that, but um, I think they've had a bit of an evolution as well. I mean, they went from, um, you know, uh, barriques made out of acacia and chestnut to tonneau made out of acacia and chestnut, and I'd have to double check, but I think it was somewhere, it was not too many vintages before this, of this wine, so we're really in the early stages of this, seeing the modern expression of, of this grape, but um, yeah, I, I mean, back to your question, it's that, I mean, sometimes it's very easy to trace the line of what we think makes a great wine, and other times it's, uh, um, Sometimes a wine makes us feel something and it's, we can't quantify it so we ignore it, but I think that the fact that we can't explain it is important to acknowledge and understanding what's profound about that experience. Yeah. And I think that's how we all ended up in wines. We all had that moment somewhere. Absolutely, yeah. oh yes. Uh, Maybe it was with a wine we don't drink <laughs> Many anymore. moments. Yeah, or, or, or as a youngster not being able to appreciate the, 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 the quality of the wine that you're drinking, but still having that profound feeling, you know, like uh, not having the, the, the technical knowledge or the, or the experience, but something's fallen upon you it's and absolutely. it's like if you look at a great piece of art or you know the the David the first time I saw the David I never I've always been into more abstract kind of um, hard to explain um, art that just kind of awakens emotion I either feel something or I don't and so when I went to see the David I was like you know I went to see it because it's what you do when you're in Florence and um, it's not that I was ever really into that kind of art so I didn't expect to have any sort of experience and then I went and stood under it and I was just you know, you had shivers, right? And, yeah. and, you know, and that changed the way I, you know, challenged the way I looked at the world. And so I hope, I think that the greatest of wines we taste will have some similar, similar impact. So Stefano, do you want to tell us a bit about the wine you brought tonight and uh, why you brought it? Yeah, I was um, struggling to find um, a great Italian wine to, to bring up today. And then um, I was uh, checking my uh, collection home and uh, this uh, beauty came came up. Say, so, okay, I was waiting to open the bottle for a, for a great occasion. Uh, I believe today is the the best opportunity to share with you guys. Um, so we go um, a Trebbiano d'Abruzzo from um, Valentini. Valentini is what we consider definitely the best uh, uh, producer of um, of the region of Abruzzo. We are by the east coast of uh, of, uh, of Italy, and um, is based in a small village called Loreto Loreto Prutino. Not far from uh, from Pescara, so we are about 10, 15 miles from the from the coast, and um, we are actually not far also from the we are in the in, the, in between the, the Adriatic Sea, the Adri Adriatic coast, and the, the highest mountains of the of the Apennines. We are uh, we go the Gran Sasso, which is almost 3,000 meters high, and that's quite important to to consider when we talk about a white wine from a central um, a part of Italy where definitely summer is quite hot and dry. Valentini is an historic producer. The family has been there for several generations and apparently from the 18th uh, century and they always been making a um, uh, wine that usually they sold like on um, bulk to local uh, cooperatives or uh, local producers. And they start uh, bottling uh, just uh, in the 1958, apparently, uh, where Eduardo Valentini, which is the, the man, obviously, behind the wine, he understood that he wanted to give up on his uh, lawyer uh, career and uh, dedicate himself like 100% to the, to the winemaking and to this uh, beautiful um, uh, underrated land. Unfortunately, he passed away like in 2006, and his uh, son, uh, Francesco, is doing I believe he's, good, he's doing great, he's doing very well, he's following the, you know, step, the path of his, uh, of his uh, father. Uh, one, he's one of the most like, mysterious white wines we got in the Italian, uh, Italian scenario for sure, um, for different reasons. He will, uh, Mr. Eduardo is not, he was not a very talkative person, he was very, uh, very shy, not uh, very uh, welcoming as we mentioned before. It's not about being welcoming, it's about the way he wanted to 
to, to express his, um, his wines. He's, he's making just the Trebbiano and um, Cerasuolo from the Montepulciano grape and the Montepulciano d'Abruzzo. Today we are uh, drinking together the 96 vintage. Uh, we go a Trebbiano d'Abruzzo that uh, Mr. Valentini used to consider the real uh, clone of the Trebbiano uh, Abruzzese. Trebbiano has been confused with uh, several different grapes in the past uh, years. Uh, we go a lot of Trebbiano uh, Toscano coming uh, through in the probably late uh, 70s or 80s. A lot of light is drinking Trebbiano from probably the Emilia Romagna region. And uh, some people com compare the Trebbiano d'Abruzzo with the Bombino Bianco from the southern part of Italy, from, uh, from, from Puglia. Um, Mr. Valentini has been always pointing at the fact that this Trebbiano is the, one of the few, like, real, uh, the, the pure Trebbiano that um, has always been uh, in the area since the, the Roman time. And uh, um, in the past years, obviously, it's been, like, probably uprooted and uh, replaced with a uh, more, like, um, um, with the, um, different grapes, as I mentioned, the, the Trebbiano Toscano, because the Trebbiano Bruzzese apparently was uh, very prone to uh, to disease and very low, uh, making very uh, having uh, very low yields. This might be the main uh, the main reason. Yeah, we have uh, um, a wine that is um, made with um, with a local traditional pergola system. So we got this. Um, particular trellis where the uh, grapes are growing below the, the foliage to, to protect the, the grapes from, uh, from, the, from the direct sunlight. We have um, a wine that we should first of all start drinking. Thank you. <coughs> Can we eat? As I mentioned, Mr. Uh, Valentini is not, it was not a very talkative uh, person and his uh, son is, let's say, is, uh, sharing the same opinion about taking people to his, uh, especially to the, to the cellar. There is just a few bunch of, uh, <laughs> a few terrible. bunch of uh, people has been uh, welcome to uh, um, access the, 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 the aging um, cellar. Um, they don't have a website, uh, they don't have an email, and there are stories about people calling the, the winery Mr. Valentini answering the phone as like, if you want my wine, just you need to write an email, hand write an, uh, uh, a letter, not an email, sorry. You need to hand write a letter and uh, tell me about your, um, your what, whatever you want, to, you want to buy. And um, yeah, I believe uh, as they, it, Mr. Valentin it was very well known for not talking much about his uh, winemaking technique. His, uh, his main point was Particular clone of uh, Trebbiano, very old uh, vineyard. We are talking about 60, 70 years old, 70 years old uh, even more. Uh, all we know that the first part of the, the fermentation goes through like cement uh, uh, tank, con concrete tank, and then we go very old Slavonian, uh, Slavonian oak, very, very old uh, Slavonian oak. Uh, the wine goes through goes to uh, the bottle usually in the uh, spring, just before the malolactic fermentation starts, and uh, they prefer to to finish the, the malolactic in a bottle. And sometimes in a in a young uh, wine, you have a, a bit of a fizzy uh, fizziness when you just pop the the cork. So, um, so, so that's an aromatic profile like no other wine that I've ever tried. Like, that it's is very just, mystic. That is incredible. It's very, very mystic it's as is, a wine. Uh, yeah, a wine yeah. that when you, I personally like, I just put my nose in this very Valentini and yeah. I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm really struggling to, to, to give a, a description of the wine yeah, because yeah. I know this right. is a Valentini. Trebbiano Abruzzese itself is a great variety. It's a great variety of a great potential uh, which is uh, even here extremely underestimated. Yeah, the, especially the part of the region. We are in the southern exactly. part, not far from Pescara. It's, uh, it's always been dominated by big cooperatives. So the idea was to make a massive production exactly. to get paid well and, and bring everything to, to the local <coughs> big, big co-op. Always to, um, yeah. interpreted like a very neutral grape variety. I mean, let's not forget that the Trebbiano, obviously, is the Uni Blanc. Uh, As the Trebbiano Toscano, yes. It, that also the, the, the Toscano, but it's actually, maybe it doesn't work on a extremely rich aromatic profile, but definitely with this evolution, with a great uh, uh, work in the vineyards uh, uh, and great work in the vineyard, uh, but without manipulating. Uh, the, the, the grape variety, the wine just uh, 
they have a very low intervention in the exactly. uh, in the vineyard, just, just so copper and sulfur, and that's yeah. all they do. And it's quite important. Fran Francesco is talking about the natural approach. He's not, uh, you know, he's not getting any. Really, he doesn't care about certification. He's not looking for it. He's just the main um, consideration is like he's worried about that, as you mentioned before, the global uh, warming. This this wine, these grapes used to be harvest in. Uh, let's say 50 years ago in mid-October or late October and now we're talking about almost the end of uh, August Beginning considering of consider last uh, last harvest it, I mean last summer Italy was super dry and hot so they definitely harvest like mid-August so third four week of, uh, of the month and that's quite important because you you struggling to reach the phenolic uh, maturation yeah. and um, He's always looking with this. He doesn't like any technology. He just walk through the through the, uh, um, the the vineyards with his very like uh, farmer boots. He's a very simple man, uh, Francesco. And he's um, checking the, the the single like berries to understand where is the right time. And he, he can realize that it's um, that can be a, a massive trouble for you know following vintages. He's struggling to keep the the phenolic and. Um, what I like of this wine, I'm very surprised about this vintage. That it's a wine that even if it's up, they never reach up to like 13 uh, ABV. They are they're super enjoyable. This freshness, almost like salty uh, texture on the after palate. It's uh, it's incredible. This uh, complexity. It's crazy. This wine. I mean, it, it, Trebbiano is probably mm. the most misunderstood and misclassified oh, yeah, and quantified grape in Italy because we think of Trebbiano Toscano, we think of Uni Blanc, we think of all of these. Lesser grapes, really, and you know, and it's. I think Trebbiano's, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, or you know, Google, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the most planted variety in Italy, uh, Trebbiano. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many types of Trebbiano. We've got Trebbiano d'Abruzzo and Trebbiano Spoletino in Umbria, in a very small part of Umbria near Montefalco. That is, you know, these are profound wines and profound grapes. And if you speak to winemakers who work with these kind of historic versions of the grape, I mean, it. it it's not the uh, Trebbiano can be very misleading, and if we go north into Suave into around around there, obviously it's a it's a different grape entirely. Also, so it's uh, uh, yeah, people can be you know put off by Trebbiano or how can a Trebbiano make a absolutely, great wine? Absolutely. But when you really go deeper below the surface in the Italian wines, I mean yeah. Trebbiano is like for me. In, if we're looking at the center of Italy, especially yeah, and 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 in, in Suave, you, you can see some really profound wines being made from the grape. And uh, this wine on, the, I mean, in the glass is crazy. I mean, like <laughs> like it needs to be locked up in chains and like you know. It's extremely ethereal. It's very mystic. It's very. Um, it's crazy on the nose. It's so tertiary. Like absolutely. you put your nose and it's like celeriac, like burnt cigar, like you know, like. You know, it's like Cohiba cigar, like tobacco cigar, like what cigar is tobacco. Fresh, her batch is like it's all the like fennel it's very seeds. It's beautiful. Like, yeah. it's her, it's her base is, and then on the palate, it's so fresh. Mm. Yeah. It's so alive. I mean, you're thinking, oh, wow, I'm really tasting an evolved wine that's yeah, at its... looking at the color, yes. You put it in your mouth and it's just like, bing! When we, when we planned that we were going to do this shoot, you can't not, I mean, if you talk to anybody and it's always like, wow, what are you going to pick? Like, what are what is going to be the assortment of wines we have to share as a group? And I think if you spoke to 100 people and, you, and they asked them to name one wine that you need to have to have any sort of relevant conversation about great Italian wines, I think 99 out of 100, you know, including... They're gonna say Valentini Treviano. I mean, you can't have a, really a conversation about the great white wines of Italy because I don't not that it's the best, but I think it's the most iconic, and we can talk about you know what does that mean and what does that matter. But I think it's uh, when you taste this wine, you know, 22 years old, and just like, you know, it's it's quite profound. It's a profound wine. And what I also love about Valentini is he's he's almost a mythical character. Yes. I've never met him. I've only had you know I've, uh, uh, teachers of mine, and when I lived in Italy, who were uh, um, close to him and, and and had great reverence for him. Um, but I love the stories you hear about him as well. Like, you know, that he would go to Rome and he would go to where his wines were sold. And if he didn't like the people selling his wines, he would buy every bottle and yeah, take them home and not announce who it was. And I was like, I love that. That's so not crazy, but it's enigmatic. And I just love people that are so uncompromising yeah. in whatever their art or whatever, their, whatever it is that they do. Um, I just, that, I don't know why that story always sticks with me. And there's many. Yeah, I like. 
I mean, I, I really like the, rather than talking about the, the wine itself, the, 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 the producer. And with Valentini, we all have these, these stories. And on the other side, we are talking about quite expensive wine on the market. And there are different reasons that we, need to, we don't need to, to, to mention. They, I mean, they make eight casks of uh, Trebbiano and then every racking they do during the, the year, they basically they end up bottling like maybe three or four or, uh, barrels, depending according to the, to the vintage. Um, but the, the beauty of this is that there is a, a moment of the year when they uh, open a part of the, of the winery and they sell not this specific wine, but the wine from that vintage, made from that grape, they sell it, as we call it in Italy, uh, sfuso, like they sell it from, from the tank. So you just need to call them in advance and you, you book your, how many liters you want of that wine. You can book your Trebbiano, your Cerasuolo. If you're very lucky, the Montepulciano, because Montepulciano, it just releases uh, red every probably six, seven years. Depends on the vintage, how happy he is with, um, with the wine. And um, I had this, uh, this uh, situation where I was, I was in Italy for, I was in Imola for a, for a concert and I was, uh, I was there like, we, we came out from this massive concert, 92,000 people watching ACDC and uh, it was... I told you. <laughs> yeah. <It's easy. laughs> yes, I love them as much as I love Valentin. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> um, we end up like very late, stuck in the traffic from Imola all the way back to, to, uh, to Abruzzo, because I'm from, I'm from Abruzzo. So um, we were driving back home and uh, I reached home like at seven o'clock in the morning. And we, that day we were supposed to go to, to pick up our Sfuso to, to, the, to the winery. It's like it's still another hour uh, driving all the way down. So we went there and you, you walk into this uh, very simple uh, room. It's inside the house. And um, you, you <coughs> dealing with this very old man sitting on this old chair, this like simple table. And uh, what's your name? Uh, Stefan from Rosetto and wherever with my friend we go like 20 liters to, to collect okay then you pay you pay cash and then they start like drawing this wine from the from the from the, from the actual tanks it's like I can't believe this you know? like, hey grab my glass you need to try this and it's like and they give it this more like dural like uh, like classic tasting uh, tasting glass that you go in uh, every countryside and uh, for me, it was a massive contradiction that the fact that they still work in this natural, like simple, simple way. And sometimes Mr. Valentini just passed by and is checking what, what's going on and um, just doesn't talk to you, of, of course. And um, he just walk away. And um, I, was, I was like checking around the, 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 the cellar. There were a few, few bottles. I was like taking a few, few shots, even if I was not allowed. But the fact that I was allowed to, to, to drink the wine straight from the, from the barrels was, uh, was incredible. They still have these whole barrels. But this is that very, there is just a part of the, of the binary that and they open up. The, the rest, the aging uh, part is not, is not open to, to public. But I really I enjoy this, this uh, very simple approach with this old man working for him for like so, so many years. He trusts him like so much. It's like everything is done, is done by hand. And um, you basically you bring you, you take your own wine and uh, you you bottle it and you you keep it for another couple of years. You can drink it as um. What well, I, I love about all of the wines we had tonight is that all of them, in their own way, kind of represent the purest essence of like the artisanal wine. You know that they're enigmatic characters who really have no. Um, I mean, they don't leave the house, let alone go to like international markets to promote their wines and pour at trade shows and you know glamorous restaurants. I mean, they're you know they're they're quirky people who don't really like to leave the house. And you know the vigneron, you know, Raffaele maybe he likes to, he likes to go, but the vignerons who from the site where the vines are, I mean, they are as uh, salt of the earth as as it gets. And I think that's you know part of the beauty. I mean, you know, you you mentioned that this is it's not a cheap wine. And it's true. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the new vintage, I think we retail our allocation and uh, we have a few more bottles for around 100, 105, 110 pounds mm -hmm. bottle. But I mean, with Valentini, Valentini is by far the most expensive of the wines we tasted tonight. And when you put that in the context of the great white wines of the world, I mean, it's, you know, it's less than uh, what's the Penfold Chardonnay. I mean, that's more expensive than Valentini. And you know, we look at, you know, <laughs> this is, I mean, this is context, premier right? crew. Um, from a top producer of uh, Poligny Montrachet, if you're lucky, right? I mean, it, when you look at the relative value of these wines for their, you know, relative greatness to their regions, and then I think with Valentini, you can easily say that this is not just one of the great wines of 
Italy, this is one of the iconic wines of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And when you think of that for the price, it seems like it's uh, pennies in a bucket as opposed to... The name Montrachet comes out very uh, often when you, when you drink in Valentini. I don't know. When you talk about great wines of the world, this has so much more personality than many other great wines of the world as well. Like this, is a, this is a really unique character. Um, it's, uh, and it's fascinating. It's mysterious and fascinating and it's beautiful. A, I think it's a very unique character because uh, we are uh, in front of, um, I mean, we are not in front of, uh, uh, again, another of the many beautiful Chardonnay that they can be produced uh, in the world, uh, uh, another of uh, a great uh, Chenin or Sauvignon. We are in front, I mean, this is the only, the one and only Trebbiano, I mean, having said that, obviously, with all the respect of all the Trebbiano producers, but this is uh, the one and only uh, Trebbiano uh, produce that really can uh, um, be in the star uh, kingdom of really the greatest wines in the world. So I think that this is also its unique point. Uh, we are in front of not again another of the hundreds of beautiful Chardonnay, but we're in front of one Trebbiano. At the moment, there is there is not in the market another the piano can definitely can be com can be put on the same uh, comparison to the one that Valentini produced. So having said that, uh, I mean uh, they're doing an amazing job in Abruzzo. There are many other producers that we were talking about before, and they do amazing expression of Trebbiano, but this is very unique. Uh, the, there's, yeah, there's always something about this wine that is just captivating in a way that is hard to explain, and then you know. I, it's, it's, it would be very easy for many people to, to pour this for many people in my own family that would be like, I don't like that wine at all because it's so particular and it's so different to anything you can taste. They might not, it might, it can challenge, it's very challenging in a way that, um, um, you know, you, it's, it's, it's not easy, it's not soft, it's not fruity, it's, but it's undeniable in a sense. And, you know, and, and again, the, the whole idea was this was to celebrate great wines of Italy, not the greatest because, um, you know, while all of these wines were quite profound, you know, there's still so many more, and in their infancy and in the, and still to come of Italy, and I think this, these just really highlight some of the peaks of um, what's out there with Italian white wine, and you know, it's not to say anything bad about um, many producers we didn't taste. Emilio Pepe makes some beautiful wines, as we talked about, and um, so many other beautiful wines around, around, around Italy, but uh, um, uh, I think these are pretty, pretty exceptional. Um, and, and the other thing, just to highlight quickly, is you know, these were all, well, I mean, Pino Bianco, you can make it, you know, maybe not indigenous, but when we look at Fiano, Treviano d'Abruzzo, and we look at uh, Frulano. Um, I mean, to see such varied and profoundly contrasting uh, indigenous varieties from, from Italy to show so beautifully, I think, uh, um, just highlights how complex the whole tapestry of Italian wine is. And, and um, for people who haven't explored, great wines of Italy or white wines in Italy so much then you know there's still so much more to discover. Thank you so much you guys for sharing, sharing such so beautiful much wines. For the invitation. Th um, so thanks for coming and thank you to uh, the team at uh, Comptoir Cafe here in Mayfair and uh, Mr. Rousset for hosting us and uh, cheers. 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 Salute. 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 Chin chin. Grazie. Thanks. Thanks for listening and we hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please take a moment to share a review online.